Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and open them, please, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We are going to be looking at a sermon that I have entitled Christmas and the War for the Cosmos. Christmas and the War for the Cosmos. And when I use that word cosmos, I am referring to everything that exists, everything that can be seen, everything that cannot be seen. So I'm talking both about our physical, visible realm that we live in currently, but I'm also talking about the unseen realm, the spiritual realm, both heaven and hell. I'm talking about also the entire universe. Everything is included in that, war, in that word cosmos. And what I want you to see this morning is that the birth of Jesus Christ was that final decisive blow in this eternal war for the cosmos that had long been waged between God and the devil. But I don't want you to walk away this morning with the misunderstanding that there was any possibility of God losing this war. At no point was God ever given a black eye by the devil, for example. At no point was the devil ever successful in actually bringing about any sort of victory over God. Rather, God's victory was secure and certain from the very beginning, before he created anything at all. And we see the absolute certainty and perfection of that victory within this text that we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you're there in Isaiah chapter 9, and if you're able, please stand with me. For the reverence of the reading of God's word, we're going to be looking from verse 2 down to verse number 7. The word of the Lord reads, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden... And the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And thus ends this reading of the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God. Receive it as such and let's pray together. Fathers, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word and we thank you for the victory which Christ wrought over Satan and all of his other adversaries as well. Lord, we thank you that we now share in that victory as those who have believed in the gospel promises of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the eternal life and salvation that is ours through them. Lord, we thank you for this victory. Lord, if there is any here this morning or perhaps one listening who does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would once more win the victory over even their souls, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself irresistibly and that today would be the day of their salvation. I pray, Lord, for the people of God this morning that through this word you would edify, strengthen, and encourage us and remind us what the true meaning of Christmas actually is. And most importantly, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through these truths as they are proclaimed from your word. Hide me behind your cross, make these words yours, O Lord, for we need to hear from you and not from me or any other man, Lord. We need your word, for we hunger and thirst after you, and we find perfect delight and joy in you alone. So be with us now, Lord, we pray. Get the glory, honor, and praise that you alone deserve, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, any of you that have known me for even just a short amount of time, probably figured out by now, Christmas is my favorite time of the year. And if you would have drove by our house in November, you would have figured it out very quickly because I already had the whole house decorated. In fact, I decorated in the middle of a snowstorm. And as I was decorating, one of our neighbors came out and they said, man, you're doing that for your kid, right? Your kid's going to love that. And I had to look at him and go, no, 
This is for me. I'm decorating the house right now. And he had no idea what to say, and so he went back inside. But the point is, I love Christmas because I love the meaning of Christmas. But even I am aware of the fact that it is very easy this time of the year with all of our busyness to get so overwhelmed with everything going on, like the buying and exchanging of gifts, the many Christmas parties that we go to, whether with family and friends or work Christmas parties or church Christmas parties. It's easy to be overwhelmed by all of these things. And so we end up keeping this Christmas season very superficial. In fact, we're almost pros at keeping things just about as superficial as they can possibly be. And so we know what happened at the first Christmas. We know the what of the Christmas story. We know what Jesus did. We know that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, was sent by the Father to this earth to love and die for sinners like you and me. And we know that this Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We know that this same Jesus, though he was in fact king of the cosmos even then, was born in a lowly manger because there was no room for him or his family within the inn. We also know that at the same time as he was being born, there were shepherds out in the field by night keeping watch of their flocks when suddenly the heavenly host appeared before them, a multitude of angels proclaiming glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill with among those with whom God is pleased. We know that those shepherds then came and they worshipped this newborn king and then We get a little mixed up sometimes, and we also sometimes include the wise men, and we think there were three of them that showed up that same Christmas night. But in reality, the wise men didn't show up that same night that Jesus was born. They showed up perhaps as far as two years later, and we don't know how many there were, whether there were three or not. But the idea is we know what happened, and so we have a basic understanding of what we do in response to those realities. We gather, we praise God with Christmas carols and Christmas hymns and Christmas songs. We talk about the birth of Jesus. We give and exchange gifts because God has given us the greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ. And yet, because we're pros at keeping things superficial, I think sometimes we neglect to see the why of Christmas. Why did these things happen? Why did Jesus have to be born? Why did Jesus have to come to this earth? Why did all of this have to transpire as it does within the scriptures? And I think that what makes Isaiah so very helpful for us is that it explains to us not only what happened at the original Christmas, but it tells us why these things had to happen. It reveals to us by pulling back the curtain, as it were, on eternity, pulling back the veil, we're able to see that the birth of Jesus Christ was perhaps the most important event in this war for the cosmos. For it was the birth of Jesus that was going to deliver that final crushing blow to our adversary, the devil. The problem though, even when we begin to talk about the why of Christmas, that Jesus had to come that he had to die for our sins, that he had to purchase our salvation, that he had to be buried, that he had to rise on the third day, that he had to ascend into heaven, that he has to rule until all things are made a footstool beneath his feet, that he will return once this has occurred and he will judge the living and the dead and we who are his will be gloriously physically resurrected at that time. We know the why, but we neglect these things and I think it's because everybody, Everybody, even even the secular world, loves baby Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus in a manger, lowly, meek, mild. Everybody loves that Jesus. The problem is, I think many have the tendency to leave Jesus in the manger. The problem is, that's not the whole Jesus. That's not the whole story. The story doesn't end with Jesus being born in a manger. Jesus grows into adulthood. He fulfills the law of God perfectly. He dies for our sins. He rises from the grave. People love baby Jesus. They just don't really like 
Jesus who walks into the temple and flips over the money changers' tables with righteous indignation because they had turned his father's house into a den of thieves. Again, they love lowly, meek, and mild Jesus, but they don't really like Jesus who returns to this earth to strike down his final enemies with sword in mouth, meaning his word. He strikes them down through his word, judging his enemies, and then swallows up even death itself in victory. The problem is, we don't have just a part of Jesus. God didn't just give us Jesus in the manger. God also gave us Jesus on the cross. God gave us Jesus exiting the tomb. God gave us Jesus ruling in heaven right now. In other words, God didn't give us a piece of Jesus. God is not stingy like Scrooge, giving out just very little here and there or none at all. God did not stingily give of his son. He didn't give just pieces of his son. He gave us the whole Christ so that we could live all of life unto his glory. And so what's so beautiful about the Christmas story and what's so beautiful about this passage in Isaiah chapter 9 is it reminds us not only of the war that Jesus was fighting on our behalf, but it reminds us that because we have been given the whole Christ, we are able now to participate and share in this eternal victory. So there are three things that we're going to look at this morning in relation to this idea of Christmas and the war for the cosmos. The first that we're going to look at is this idea of Jesus as the light of the world. We're going to see how he delivers that striking, crushing, final piercing blow to Satan. We're also going to see how Jesus defeats his enemies and destroys their weapons. And then finally, we will see how this King Jesus causes us to participate in and share in this victory. And I pray it will be both encouraging to you this morning, but also challenging to you that we would keep our eyes on Jesus, especially over the next week, but every single moment of every single day of our lives. So the first thing that we want to look at this morning, number one, we see that the light that pierces the darkness is Jesus. The light that pierces the darkness is Jesus. Jesus, when he was born, was effectively like a lightning bolt being sent down from heaven that totally eradicated the darkness that Satan had plummeted the earth into. Jesus was like a spear in the hands of the Father used to pierce through Satan and sin and darkness and even death itself. Because when you read scripture, you have to see that darkness is symbolic of sin and darkness, whereas light is symbolic of life and holiness. So darkness, that's wickedness, wretchedness, evil. Light, that's holiness, life, goodness, righteousness. And Jesus comes and he eradicates the darkness on our behalf. Look at verses two and three. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Who are the people who walked in darkness? Well, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you find out that it was the land of Naphtali. It was the people living in Judea in those days where Jesus was born in Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee of the nations. But it's more than that, too. The people who walked in darkness were you and me. And everybody else that we know, and everybody else who has ever lived outside of Jesus himself. We are all born into this world with a sin nature. Because of the transgressions of Adam and Eve, we are born into this world with a natural inclination, with a natural bent towards loving our sin, but hating God. And thinking that we will find more joy in our sin than we could ever possibly find in God. And we deceive ourselves. Because while it is true that you might find pleasure in sin for a time, pleasure is way different than joy. Joy only comes to the Christian. Because joy is only found in Christ. But we deceive ourselves. And we walk in this spiritual darkness, this spiritual blindness. And we're actually afraid to look to the light that is Jesus Christ. But here we see 
when Jesus came, he caused the light to dawn. And he now causes the light to spread. And as it eradicates darkness, it also opens the eyes of those who are blind. So those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. That light is Jesus. And you, this is speaking now to God, have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. What nation is in view here? The nation of Israel? Not quite. This is not about the physical nation of Israel, but about the kingdom of God. This is about the fact that Jesus is the true Israel of God. And all of those who believe in Jesus Christ by faith become part of his body. We are united to him. And being united to true Israel makes us what? True Israel. We become, as Peter says, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a chosen nation set apart for our king and our God. So we are the nation of God and we are rejoicing, not only that we've seen the light, but that others are seeing the light, that others are being brought into this kingdom. We rejoice at the harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But praise the Lord, when we see that harvest reap, when we see more brought into the nation, we rejoice. We rejoice as those who receive the plunder of our enemies. Because in, in, in fact, what Jesus did when he came to this earth is he bound up the devil in such a way that he humiliated him and now forces him to watch the plundering of his own domain. And what's being plundered from Satan's domain? Sinners. Like you and I being saved and set apart for the Lord Jesus Christ, being made members of his celestial city, being made members of his nation and his kingdom. So yes, we rejoice at the salvation of sinners. We rejoice as more are added into the body of Christ when this spoil is divided. And this all happens because... Jesus is the light that pierces the darkness. See, there's two ideas here. The first relates to the physicality of it all. When Jesus came to this earth, he healed those who were physically blind. He brought those who could not see sight. But there's always a spiritual implication behind every physical miracle that was performed. And the spiritual reality of the physical miracle is far greater than what was done there. The physically blind seeing is wonderful. But even more wonderful still is when those who are spiritually blind, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, are brought to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and they see him and they behold him in his glory. That is more miraculous and more glorious than anything else. Anybody that says miracles don't happen today don't recognize that the greatest miracle of all is what occurs when those who are spiritually dead are brought to life in Christ. It's the greatest miracle, the most amazing miracle. I would argue perhaps even more incredible than God creating this earth out of nothing, this universe out of nothing, is when God raises one who is spiritually dead. And every time that happens, the light grows and more darkness is eradicated around us. We see this actually in Luke chapter 2, don't we? In verses 8 to 14, when those angels appear to announce the birth of Jesus, we see light, we see rejoicing, and we see a proclamation of the gospel. Listen to this. And in that same region, region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When Jesus is born, the angels come to the earth and they cannot help but radiate with the light of God's glory. 
They cannot help but sing praises to God as they rejoice in Him. And they cannot help but declare the good news of the gospel. Each of those characteristics should mark us as Christians. We should shine with the gospel light. We should radiate with joy and sing praises to our God. And we should be most willing, joyfully, to go forth and share this word, this gospel, with others. At the same time, though, we cannot neglect, we cannot fail to see that this is a war in which we are engaged. It's a war over which we are victorious because Christ himself is victorious, but it's a war all the same. That's why verse 3 talks about delighting over plunder, plundering our enemies. That is war-like language, and that is intentional. That is on purpose. So we cannot fail to see that there is peace, yes, but it's only for those who belong to Christ. It's peace, yes, and goodwill, yes, but only to those with whom God is pleased. Who is God pleased with? Answer, those who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. One theologian, reflecting on these truths, wrote this. He said, Bethlehem was the opening gambit in the last campaign of a long war. Many centuries after our father Adam had plunged our race into the insanity of sin, God finally made his opening move. Jesus Christ, born of a woman, born under the law, was born to fulfill every one of the numerous promises that God had made during our long night. At the beginning of our world, scarcely had our race fallen into sin and darkness, but our father God swore that the seed of the woman would have vengeance upon the serpent promising us a glorious deliverance. And so, for long ages, the faithful looked ahead to that undefined day, figuring, studying, mentally groping, but fundamentally trusting. What form would the dragon slayer take? What form would the serpent worm have in the day when his head was finally crushed? Well, as it would turn out, Satan who thinks himself so powerful and so strong, who disguises himself as an angel of light, was defeated and conquered by the Son of God incarnate, who had veiled his glory in the flesh. Satan was not powerful enough to destroy the God-man, but rather was so weak that he was defeated by the all-victorious, conquering Christ. This true and living king of the cosmos. And so we must recognize that when he sends us forth, we are still being led by our captain, but we are being led forth to plunder a world which Jesus has effectively conquered. We're being sent forth to harvest that which Jesus has effectively already set before us. We are being set forth not to fight for victory, but rather we fight from within a state of eternal victory, which we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15 had promised that these things would be so. After Adam and Eve sin, God appears in the garden and he speaks to Satan and he says, listen, there will be a seed born to the woman. There will be enmity between you or your offspring and her offspring, but that one seed, he will come and he will crush your head. And that's exactly what Jesus comes and does. He is the dragon slayer. He is the serpent crusher who stomps the head of Satan beneath his feet. And now will continue to rule until all things are made a footstool beneath his feet. The question is, how do we live in light of those truths? And the answer was actually already given to us this morning in Ephesians chapter 5. Let me read just a few of those verses again. In Ephesians 5, verses 8 to 16, we read, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. So try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them because again you are light for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret but when anything is exposed by the light it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light therefore it says awake O sleeper and arise from the dead and christ will shine on you 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. How do we shine as light? How do we make the best use of the time? By obeying God, by delighting in him, by praising him, by going forth and sharing the gospel. We walk as those soldiers who are victorious in this war for the cosmos. And we follow our captain out into the field, which is not only ripe for the harvest, but is ready to be plundered for his glory. So we go forth with confidence in our king because he is the light that pierces, dispels, eradicates, and destroys the darkness. At the same time, number two, we see the one who destroys both the wicked and their weapons is Jesus. The one who destroys both the wicked and their weapons is Jesus. Look at verses four and five. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. I love these verses. Look, look carefully at it. The yoke of burden, the staff and rod of the oppressor, they're broken. They're shattered. Who, who does it? Christ. Christ breaks and shatters their weapons. And then we see this tramping boot these garments that are covered in the blood of their violent and wicked ways, Jesus takes and burns. Truly, all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of God. So here stand our enemies, which before we were so fearful of, we thought them to be so powerful, so ferocious. Here they are, stripped of their clothing, naked, their weapons completely destroyed, and now they stand before the God, the judge of the cosmos, and they are judged by him, and they are destroyed. See, beloved, there's a day coming when God will return to this earth. Jesus will come back, and he will right every wrong, every tear will be wiped from the eyes of his people, and our enemies will finally and completely be put beneath his feet. They will be forced to bow. Their knees will be broken beneath them and they will bow the knee and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God, though they will not be saved. And as their knees are broken so that they bend at the same time, we will willingly fall before our Lord with great joy in our hearts, pronouncing him to be not just Savior, but Lord of our lives as well. And so you have those who are broken and those who have been healed by Christ side by side with one another announcing that he is Lord, one filled with despair, for they know their end is destruction and eternity in the lake of fire, and the others with joy and rejoicing in their hearts, knowing that there is peace now on this earth forevermore. When that day comes, think of how great it will be. No more war. Weapons destroyed. No more violence. No more sadness. Every tear wiped from our eyes. No more sickness, no more death, all of it consumed in the everlasting victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate, beloved, during this Christmas season. And we know that these things must be. We know that they have to come to pass because we know that at the end of the day, it is right that good triumph over evil in every imaginable and conceivable way. Because deep down, we know that evil itself, listen carefully, evil itself is boring. You say, how could that be? How could evil itself be boring? Well, consider John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, speaking of Satan, speaking of evil, comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So what is the thief? What is evil doing? It's trying to destroy the goodness of God's creation. But Jesus, the good shepherd, he says, comes to give life and to give that life, by the way, abundantly. So evil has as its aim destruction, death. Jesus has as his aim life, creation, recreation, rebirth, everlasting. This is why the early church father Athanasius wrote these words. The presence and love of the word had called Adam and Eve into being. Inevitably, therefore, when they lost the knowledge of God, they lost genuine existence with it. 
For it is God alone who exists, and evil is non-being, the negation and antithesis of good. In other words, what Athanasius was getting at, I believe, was this. If the thief comes to steal, then Jesus comes to give. If the thief comes to kill, then Jesus comes to give life. And if the thief comes to destroy, then Jesus comes to give life abundantly and to recreate. And we know deep down that it's what Jesus does, not what Satan does, but what Jesus does that thrills our souls. We know that it's what Jesus does that brings us the greatest joy and contentment and satisfaction. Can evil bring pleasure for a time? Yeah, but ultimately it's boring. We know this. Before we were saved by Christ, perhaps maybe even you haven't been saved by Christ yet, but before I was saved, I know there was a time where I took pleasure in sin, but that sin ultimately didn't satisfy. It would have to go bigger, grander. And that too wouldn't satisfy. Ultimately, that too would be boring. But Christ never grows old. Christ never stops satisfying us. I don't care how many times I hear the gospel. It thrills me every single time to hear of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus who saves sinners from their sins. We know that the gospel is glorious. And we know that in Jesus we find our everlasting joy. So what then does it mean for us? It means for us that the Christmas story is about the king of the cosmos being born in a manger, a wooden manger, to one day die on a wooden cross so that one day he could take these weapons of warfare and break them as fuel for the fire. He will consume them in his victory and there will finally be peace on that most glorious day. Which then leads us into this third truth. We see number three, the eternal king who brings us victory in the war for the cosmos is Jesus. The eternal king who brings us victory in the war for the cosmos is Jesus. You're not going to have victory apart from him. You're not going to find comfort or solace or peace apart from Christ. He alone grants us this victory. So look again, verses six and seven. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Both for us. For to us, he's born. To us, he is given by the Father. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Which government? The government of the world. We live in the already, not yet. Jesus is already the ruler of the world, the ruler of the cosmos, but it has not yet been completely consummated. There's a day coming, though. Praise the Lord. When every king, every ruler who has defied him will be cast out and he will rule perfectly and forevermore. So the government will be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called, look at this, Wonderful Counselor. Now I would, I would argue that it's possible in the Hebrew to put a comma in between wonderful and counselor so that you have two names there. But either way, it works. We know that this Jesus is wonderful. There's none more beautiful, none more glorious than him. He is our counselor. When we have a need, when we have a problem, we can go before him and we know that he hears us when we pray. He is our mighty God. When we pray, he meets our needs according to his riches and glory. There's nothing that he cannot do. And he delights to hear our prayers. He's our everlasting father. And so he delights to meet our needs. He delights to do what we need him to do. He is, in fact, our prince of peace. And so of the increase of his government and of his peace over the earth, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So Jesus is going to rule, and he's going to rule perfectly. He's going to rule sovereignly. And it's as Habakkuk 2.14 says, isn't it? The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will most certainly cover this earth as the waters cover the seas. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Of the increase of his peace, there will be no end. But the battlefields will be plundered, and he will save every last soul that the Father has promised to him. The harvest will finally and completely be brought in, and he will rule eternally, forevermore. Now, the question some might ask is, that's wonderful, that's great. 
What do we need to do to see this happen? And here's the beauty of it. In effect, nothing. God's going to do it himself. Look, Notice the last part of that verse. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God is most certainly going to accomplish what we read in this passage. There is no doubt about it. He has promised it, and it is true, and it is happening even now. And yet, I said, we don't have to do anything. Here's the deal, though. God works through ordinary means. He works through human agents like you and I. So God didn't have to do it this way, but he has chosen to utilize us to go forth and proclaim his word, to go forth and to proclaim his gospel, to see the harvest brought in, to see the plundering of the battlefield completed. He utilizes us, but don't be mistaken. The kingdom of God does not rise or fall according to me or according to you. It is God's promise that this is going to take place. It is God's promise that this is going to happen. And so we know that his kingdom will be successful. His kingdom will grow. His kingdom will flourish. We know that ultimately, too, it's not up to us to see sinners saved. It's up to us to be faithful to the gospel and then leave the result to God. See, our success is not at all about numbers. Our success has everything to do with faithfulness. And when we're faithful... God has promised he too will be faithful. And his kingdom will increase. His kingdom will grow. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is why, quoting from Athanasius again, he said, it was our sorry case that caused the word to come down, our transgression that called out God's love for us so that he made haste to help us and to appear among us. You and I know we couldn't save ourselves. So we should also know we can't save others. But God can save. God does save. Jesus saves sinners. Three simple words, but the most important words that we can repeat, Jesus saves sinners. And with that confidence, we are to go forth into this world knowing Psalm 110 verses 1 to 2 are true. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Jesus is reigning and ruling, conquering and defending, and he will continue to do so until all things are put under his feet. So in light of all of these truths, I think that there are three takeaways for us this morning. Three things that we specifically should do in light of these truths. And the first one is a very simple one, very straightforward. We should sing praises to our God. We should take delight and joy in our God. Just like the angels on that first Christmas day appearing to those shepherds out in the night, we too should delight in our God and we should sing praises to our God for what he has done for us. And not just on Sunday mornings. I'm talking all throughout the week. Beloved, I'm talking do this with your families. Praise the Lord with song. And you say, but we don't do that. Start doing it anyway. But it's going to be awkward. Probably do it anyway. And it will bring you great joy and it will bring God great glory. In fact, do it on Christmas Sunday. You say, well, my family doesn't like doing that. Do it anyway. What a great opportunity to share the gospel with them. And hey, if you're hosting Christmas and you want your company to leave fast, start singing Christmas carols. It's almost guaranteed they will leave. But praise God, because that is what he is worthy of. That's what Christmas is about. Secondly, live as light in the world. As we saw, that means live righteously, live holy. Don't behave as you once did. No longer walk in darkness. For Christ, the hope of glory, the light that pierced the darkness, resides within you through the Holy Spirit. How utterly foolish it would be for us just to go back to the darkness, to go back to our wickedness, to go back to our sinfulness. When you fall short, repent, but then live holy. Be holy as God is holy. You have many opportunities over the next few weeks to do just that during the holiday season. And then finally, again, very straightforward and simple, Go and proclaim the victory of the king. Go 
Tell it on the mountain, over the hill, and everywhere. Christ is born. Christ has died. Christ was buried. Christ is risen. Christ is ascended. Christ is coming back again. War is over because Christ has won. And all who will repent of their sins and believe in him will share in this victory as well. And so I hope each and every one of you this morning is already sharing in this victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. If not, repent of your sin, trust in him, and he will save you, and it will be yours. And if you do know him, then remember, we're not fighting for victory, as it were, but we are fighting from within victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you think of Christmas and the war for the cosmos, Remember this king of peace, this king of victory. Remember your king, Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the truth of your word. What glorious gospel promises you have given us even during the Christmas season. Lord, now as we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper with one another, I pray that you would bless us. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare us for it. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive of it seriously, but joyfully as well. And I pray, Lord, that you would receive the glory, honor, and praise that you alone are due. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.